KWT slaying. Salama family, Salama, how y'all doing today? Hope you're blessed and highly favored. If I sound okay, give me a one, please. And uh, if not, give me a two. Just want to make sure. All right. Okay, so before I get started, I want to uh, share something with you all that my brother Artur Ben Yehuda shared with me. Now this, this doesn't have anything with what we're talking about today, but uh, this is what he shared. He said, man, we went to Moshi this past week here in Tanzania. It's at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. We went with one of our Tanzanian clients and the most high put it on my heart to talk to her about who we are. She's from a tribe called Chaga, the Chaga tribe. So check this, check this. She tells us when she was little, the elders and their parents told them that Chaga means travelers and that they were the Jews and they fled to Mount Kilimanjaro region from Lalibela, Ethiopia. She says she never really paid it any attention until I broke it down about us being the people. Once again, you could keep holding on to that Middle East location, but the evidence keeps pointing to Lalibela in, in Ethiopia. All right, so today we're going to uh, talk about some things that, you know, once again, you can either eat the meat, spit out the bones, make your own conclusions. You know, maybe some of y'all still holding on to America being your homeland. Uh, but here's the thing. The scripture says in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So this is why this is a truth ministry, because I want my people to be free. We need to be set free. We've been held hostage through lies. Some of those lies even come from our own people, mind you. Some intentionally, some unintentionally. So here's the thing. Before I get started, because it's going to probably affect how much you understand. So give me a one if you follow the videos about Spain and Portugal. If you followed our videos about the Moors, you know, and how we all were kicked out of Spain and Portugal. If you got that foundation, give me a one. All right, look like most of us have a foundation because all of this stuff is going to come together. And understand this, after this particular video, I'm going to work on another video. Now, this secondary video that I'm going to work on is probably going to have to be shown on uh, either BitChute or Odyssey, right? Or Odyssey, right? That's O-D-Y-S-E-E -E for Odyssey and BitChute. B-I-T-S-H-U-T-E. It, it's usually I put them on both because sometimes my, my videos might be a little bit large, so I can't go to some of the Hebrew sites because of the two gig limit. 
like this video here is going to be big. OK, so understand this, that that foundation is going to play a key role in your understanding of what's happening, what has happened in the past. OK, because after the Inquisition, yes, they, they sent us to Sao Tome. They sent us to Africa. But the question remains, what happened to the elite Israelites? What happened to the ones who are ruling under the Moorish Empire? That's what they call it. But it was a Israelite slash Muslim empire, right? We've already talked about those Moorish Hebrew Israelite Jews. If you haven't seen that, go look at the video uh, dealing with Portugal and Spain, dealing with El, El Andalus, things like that. So some of you all who haven't seen those videos, you might be a little lost. But understand, the secondary video that I'm going to work on is going to be more like a Twilight Zone video, right? It's, it's going to be a prophecy slash history slash modern history story all rolled up into one about what's happening, and it is crazy. If what I'm seeing is legit, it's crazy. Now, I, I talked to a few people about it, and I, I talked to uh, my brother Doug Rice about it. You know, we had a little conversation about it because I had to share some of that with some people. So let's get started. All right, hold on one second, fam. Hold on, please. All right, these walls are thin. Because if you didn't know, fam, I'm going to let you know. Guess where your Cobra is right now? Your Cobra's back in Texas. Yep, your Cobra's back in Texas. So, uh, you know, I'm in an apartment now instead of a house. Praise the most high, Yahuwah. Got a roof over my head. But I'm back in Texas, fam. But anyway, <laughs> that's how the world is today, right? So let me share. Let's get started. Let's get started. So the divine right to rule, the divine right to rule. What is the divine right to rule? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why there probably, in my opinion, there was such a thing as the divine right to rule. So introduction, the deeper we dig into our history, we see the coordinated effort to hide who we are. Don't we see that all the time? They whited out who we are, right? They whited out who Yeshua was, right? They whited out all the history we know of today, right? Everything is white. Ain't nothing black, nothing African, all this stuff, right? We gonna see all that with lies. I mean, they didn't white it out the whole world. Almost literally. The other nations stole our heritage, our identity, our lands, and our rulership. This historical breakdown may be hard to believe, but this is what I see in our history. The Inquisition was just the beginning, and the transatlantic slave trade is the result they wanted us to always live in. However, what happened after the Moors got kicked out of Spain and Portugal? What happened to the elite of the Israelites in Europe? The Moors ruled for approximately 800 years. So we know that the Moors were ruling. We know that there were some, some elite Israelites. We know according to the history that we've covered in the past, dealing with Spain and Portugal, some of our elite people were able to pay money and leave early. Some of them were able to leave Spain and go to Portugal. Some paid and were able to leave uh, Portugal and go other places. Some left Portugal and Spain. We talked about this in the past and went to France. Some went to Britain during the time of the Inquisition. And as the Inquisition increased and they chased us around the globe, literally, as they chased us around the globe from country to country, nation to nation, they say, let's get rid of these Negroes. So understand that as we see today, the elite, the power structure, they don't fall away as quick as the common folks. Because guess what? When they make those moves, they make those agreements with some of those some of those elites. When they move against their people, some of the elites sell out. When they move against their people, some of the elites say, well, you know what? I'm going to be Catholic anyway, so it's all good. Understand, 
this stuff is crazy. I know it's going to be hard to believe. Look, just like for me in the beginning, it was hard for me to believe some things. But the more you dig, the more the information comes together, the more the history comes together, and you'd be like, okay, well, I guess I got to believe this. It all ties together. This is such a situation. So overview, do not believe my interpretation of this history. Do your own research. This is the greatest overthrow of world rulership ever seen. Europe was ruled by Israelites for more than 800 years. The kings and queens of whom you believe were white were Negroes. I know this is hard to believe, but this is how big the lie is. I've heard this for a long time. It was hard for me to believe it. I was taught that Europe was white. When I woke up and people start telling me, oh, no, Europe was black, it still was hard to believe. Some of us can't believe it until we put these pieces together. We got to see evidence because what we see today is a white Britain, a white France, a, a white Italy, a white uh, Scotland, a white uh, Ireland, a, a white Norway, a white Finland. Everything has been white. Well, what happened? Joseph Goebbels says, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. This is what they have done to us. It's the same thing the camps do, right? The camps always, every time you see the camps come on, they talk about, you know, the Negro, the Mexican, and the Native American Indian. They always repeat that mantra. Why? Because it's a big lie, and they repeat it enough, and people believe it. This is what they did. This is where the camps learn it from. Joseph Goebbels. Repeat a lie that's big enough. Keep repeating it, and people are going to believe it. So a review of El Andalus. So we've discussed the history of our people in Spain and Portugal. The black Jews is what they called us. Okay, we got this. This is history. It's confirmed. We got the evidence. We got the documentation. We have the receipts. We also discussed how they took our children and converted them to Roman Catholicism. During these perilous times for Israel, what happened to the elite Israelites who ruled during the times of the Inquisition? What happened to the black Jews who were able to pay to escape? We know that some of the black Israelites went to Britain, France, and other parts of Europe, like I mentioned. Some were also in Scotland. Yes, I know this is hard to believe, and we will not cover everything here today because it is too much. Dig in for yourself. Deuteronomy 28, blessings. Before the curses, there were the blessings. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt listen diligently unto the voice of Yahuwah, thy Elohim, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above what? All nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee several ways. A lot of us believe all of that happened during the time of King David or the King Solomon. But I will submit to you a lot of this also happened during the time of the Moorish invasion of Europe. We were under the blessings. Now, some of us started falling away from the faith at that time, but we were still under the blessings. You know, it takes a while for those blessings to start disappearing. It takes a while for, for Israel to start going to the point of no return. And the Most High say, that's enough. I'm, I'm, I'm going to whip your tail. It takes a while. The Apostle Paul. We know from canon that the Apostle Paul went to Spain. However, based upon a pseudepigraphia, he may have also gone to Britain. Why is this important? Based upon some of the things we will discuss today, these things start to make some sense. Let the hard evidence persuade you. 
but the supporting things like what I'm about to discuss will help add to the story. So you're going to be required to go do your research. I will add some of these re resources and references to the dis description at the end. Acts 29. Now, there's an organization called Acts 29. I never knew that there was a document called Acts 29. In previous studies, we've shown how the black Jews were in Spain and Portugal. We've shown how they were considered a part of the Moors that conquered Spain and Portugal. What we did not discuss is that there were Israelite tribes or clans in Scotland and Israelite monarchs ruling England, Ireland, and Scotland. I know this is hard to believe, but we will get to the proofs. However, let's look at Acts 29, Pseudepidographia, about the Apostle Paul being in Britain. Okay, so <laughs> this got a little off in the import family. Sorry about that. So we've seen in our investigation the persistent rumors of Joseph of Arimathea in Britain and how it is that we have been misdirected as to his burial place by the propaganda put out by Henry Blois. So they were saying that Joseph of Arimathea was in Britain. Is, is it true? You know, how many Israelites do we know that were in Britain? I mean, nobody told us that, right? So this particular frame here is titled The Missing Chapter of Acts 29 of the apostles. So when we start to search into how it is that the Britons have a tradition of St. Paul coming to Britain and whether this is true, it seems any early apostolic tradition has been expunged just as the tradition of Joseph of Arimathea visiting Britain. These traditions as Augustine found in Britain were very much alive when he arrived, who preferred their own traditions before all the churches in the world. From a very early period, there could only be one culprit, the very empire which morphed into the self-professed inheritor of Christ, the corrupt Vatican Empire. The Roman church, to maintain their monopoly, has been behind editing the sequence of events that transpired directly after the crucifixion. Both Joseph and of Arimathea and St. Paul came to Britain. But since the very beginning of the Roman church's claim to primacy, wherever possible, any evidence of these visits have been purposefully obscured. So did Paul go to Britain? Did Joseph of Arimathea go to Britain? We know who was behind the widening out of our history. Family, let me ask you. You all know who was behind the whiting out of our history. Was it hit one if it was the Vatican, hit two if it was somebody else? Who was behind the whiting out of our history? Who made and gave us white Jesus? Who took and gave us a Gentile perspective or a Greek version of the Bible? It was the Catholic Church. It was the Vatican. You're going to see that they are behind all this stuff. They are liars. They are thieves. They are deceivers. And if for some reason YouTube pulls this down, it'll be on the other channels. So, so Nini Greek manuscript. So why did St. Paul wish to visit Spain in the British Isles? We should look at a little known and often dismissed document that has much in common with our investigation. The document is now understood to be chapter 29 of the original Acts of the Apostles and was translated by C.S. Sonini from an original Greek manuscript found in the archives at Constantinople and presented to him by the Sultan Abdul Ahmed while visiting Constantinople. Now note that the person who found the manuscript has a part of his name that is African. It's the African word Sonini. This is where we get Sonini Nanini. All right, so this guy, he has an African name. Origins of Sonini, Gosa, African English. So 56% Kosa. This is from names.org. 
Longer bars in the bar graph indicate that people in the country are more interested in the name. Not all countries that have shown an interest in the name are listed in the bar graph. What is the longest bar graph with Sonini? Lesotho. What's the second largest for Sonini? Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa. We can see this is an African name. We all know about Sonini Nanini, all right? So Charles Nicholas Sixbert Sonini, African name, their man's court. Look like a brother to me, right? Light-skinned brother. Got a little wig on his head. Charles Nicholas Sixberg, Sonini de Manscourt, or Manonscourt, was more than likely of African descent. In other words, a descendant of the Moorish Jews that lived where? In Europe. Okay? They admit he was of African descent. He is the son of Nicholas Charles Philip Sonini, originally from the Papal States. From the Papal States, keep that in mind. See, some of our people were traitors, just like today. Rolling with Catholicism, agents of Catholicism, settled in the Duchy of Lorraine and advisor to the King of Poland, life Duke of Lorraine and Bar, Stanislaus Laskinski, private receiver of finances and the Lord of Fife of Monocourt in Vermos, ennobled in 1756. Charles Nicholas Sig Sigisburg. Sonini de Manascourt studied at the University of Ponte Mousson at the Jesuit boarding school. See, he's a Jesuit, but he's an Israelite, and was elevated to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy on July 29, 1766, at 15 and a half. Now, okay, let me let me finish this. Lorraine and Barrios then became French on the death of King Stanislas in February of the same year. Charles Nicholas de Manacourt studied law in Strasbourg, was admitted as a lawyer at the Sovereign Court of Nancy on, on November 14, 1768. Now, remember, if you remember the studies dealing with Spain and Portugal, some of the kids that were left in Spain and left in Portugal ended up having grandparents. Those were some of those Europeans who were Catholics who raised those kids to be quote unquote Christian or to be Catholics, and they trained those kids to what to serve them to be servants. I believe that Monacourt here, Sonini de Monacourt, is probably descendant of one of those children who were conditioned in the papal states, ruled by their quote unquote grandparents who were of the papal states who were under the Vatican rule. So history of Sonini manuscript. It gives an account of trips undertaken by St. Paul after his two years in forced residence in Rome in his own hired house. This lost chapter 29 of Acts of the Apostles was found interleaving in a copy of French naturalist Sonini de Manicourt voyage in Greece at in Turkey. It was purchased at the sale of the library in effects of the late right, right Honorable Sir John Newport, Bart MP in Ireland, whose family's arms were engraved on the cover of the book. It had been in their possession for more than 30 years with a copy of the royal decree, Furman of the Sultan of Turkey, granting to C.S. Sonini permission to travel in all parts of the Ottoman dominions. Notice that Newport, Sir John Newport, in Ireland. We, that's going to be important. That's going to be important. Keep that in, in your mind. Sir John Newport in Ireland. So original not found. No trace of the original Greek manuscript has been found to date. And for this reason, the document is considered a fake. Just because you ain't find a document don't mean it's a fake. I'm not saying it's legit. I don't know. I'm just saying, just because you don't have the original. Because we don't have the original of some of what we call canon, but we use that, right? So I'm, I'm just saying. Also, the document appeared at a time when supposedly a new theory was in vogue that the Britons were part of the lost tribes of Israel. Few have considered that if a Frenchman had been handed the original, 
he would most certainly have handed it to a Catholic authority for verification. The original would never be heard of again if it glorified holy links to Britain. The title page of Sonini's work in which the English translation of the document was found has this written on it. British Israelism. Could the idea of British Israelism be true? Don't get mad at me yet, family. Stick with me. But the people represented as Brits were, in fact, Negroes. The Negroes left over from the start of the Inquisition. These are the Negroes who were behind, left behind some of those elites after the Inquisition who still had some power because they were working along with the Catholic Church, just like, just like Sonini Monocourt. The Negroes who went along with Rome in their expulsion of the Jews from Europe, but got away because of their wealth and influence. I believe that the true European elites were the leftover elites from the rulership of the Moors. And this is true. As you see, you're going to see this connection. We will see why I say this as we continue our journey. X29 script. The Sonini manuscript is almost certainly the concluding portion of the Acts of the Apostles and gives an account of Paul's journeys after his two years in forced residence in Rome. The following is the English translation of the Sonini manuscript, which was originally in Greek. So this is this man's opinion, but let's look at the Sonini manuscript translated. Acts 29, verse 1 through 4. Now remember, family, in our Bible, there is no Acts 29, okay? And Paul, full of the blessings of Yeshua, and abounding in the spirit, departed out of Rome, determining to go into Spain. For he had a long time purpose to journey thitherward, and was minded also to go from thence into Britain. So we know for a fact that Paul went to Spain. That's in what we call canon. But here it says he determined to go to Britain. For he had heard in Phoenicia that certain of the children of Israel about the time of the Syrian captivity had escaped by sea to the isles afar off, as spoken by the prophet and called by the Romans Britain. And the Lord commanded the gospel to be preached far hence to the Gentiles and to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And no man hindered Paul. For he testified boldly of Yeshua before the tribunes and among the people, and he took with him certain of the brethren which abode with him at Rome. And they took shipping at Ostium, and having the winds fair, were brought safely into a haven of Spain. So according to this, he went from Britain to Spain. Acts 29, 5-9. And much people were gathered together from the towns and villages in the hill country, for they had heard of the conversion of the apostle and the many miracles which he had wrought. And Paul preached mightily in Spain, and great multitudes believed and were converted, for they perceived he was an apostle sent from Yahuwah. And they departed out of Spain, and Paul and his company, finding a ship in Armorica, sailed unto Britain. They went therein, passing along the south coast. They reached a port called Raffinus. Now when it was noised abroad that the apostle had landed on their coast, great multitudes of the inhabitants met him, and they treated Paul courteously, and he entered in at the east gate of their city and lodged in the house of an Hebrew and one of his own nation. And on the morrow he came and stood upon Mount Lud, and the people thronged at the gate and assembled in the broadway. He preached Yeshua unto them, and many believed the word and the testimony of Yeshua. So understand this. According to this document, there were some already there in Britain from the time of the Assyrian captivity. We also know from other documentation, go back if you haven't seen it, you know, the Spain and Portugal series, where some of our people who were descendant of King David, King David, were in Spain. And they were there since the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So none of this stuff should be a surprise. Acts 29, 10 through 13. 
And that even the Holy Ghost fell upon Paul and he prophesied, saying, Behold, in the last days the God of peace shall dwell in the cities, and the inhabitants thereof shall be numbered. And in the seventh numbering of people their eyes shall be opened, and the glory of their inheritance shine forth before them, and nations shall come up to worship on the mount that testifies to the patience and long suffering of a servant of the Lord. And in the latter days new tidings of the gospel shall issue forth out of Jerusalem, and the hearts of the people shall rejoice, and behold, fountains shall be opened, and there shall be no more plague. In those days there shall be wars and rumors of wars, and a king shall rise up, and his sword shall be for the healing of the nations, and his peacemaking shall abide, and the glory of his kingdom a wonder among princes. And it shall come to pass that certain of the Druids, now understand, Druids can mean like we know as witches and all that stuff, but Druids can also mean things like prophets or seers, you know, sort of like, you know, like we see in Africa. But I digress. And it came to pass that certain of the Druids came unto Paul privately and showed by their rites and ceremonies they were descended from the Jews, which escaped from the bondage in the land of Egypt. And the apostle believed these things, and he gave them the kiss of peace. Acts 29, 14, 18. Paul stayed and lived there for three months. He was confirmed in the faith and preached Christ continually. And after these things, Paul and his brethren departed from Raphinus and sailed unto Atium in Gaul. And Paul preached in the Roman garrisons and among the people, exhorting all men to repent and confess their sins. And there came to him certain of the Belgae to inquire of him of the new doctrine and of the man Yeshua. And Paul opened his heart unto them and told them all things that had befallen him, how be it that Yeshua came into the world to save sinners. And they departed, pondering among themselves upon the things which they had heard. And after much preaching and toil, Paul and his fellow laborers passed into Helvet Helvetia and came unto Mount Pontius Pilate, where he who condemned the Lord Yeshua dashed himself down headlong and so miserably perished. Nineteen and twenty-four, and immediately a torrent gushed out of the mountain, and washed his body, broke it in pieces into a lake. And Paul stretched forth his hands upon the waters and prayed unto unto the Lord, saying, "O Lord God, sign, give a sign unto all nations that here punches Pilate, which condemned thine only begotten Son, plunged headlong into the pit." And while Paul was yet speaking, behold, there came a great earthquake, and the face of the waters was changed, and the form of the lake like unto the Son of Man hanging in the agony upon a cross. Take that as you will, fam. Verse 22. And a voice came out of heaven saying, Even Pilate had escaped the wrath to come, for he washed his hands before the multitude at the blood shedding of the Lord Yeshua. When therefore Paul and those that were with him saw the earthquake and heard the voice of the angel, they glorified God and were mightily strengthened in spirit. And they journeyed and came to Mount Julius, where stood two pillars, one of the right hand and one of the left, erected by Caesar Augustus. And Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, stood up between two pillars, saying, Men and brethren, these stones which ye see this day shall testify of my journey hence. And verily I say, they shall remain until the outpouring of the Spirit upon all nations. Neither shall the way be hindered throughout all generations. And they went forth and came unto Iacurnum, Iriacum, I can't pronounce that well, intending to go by Macedonia into Asia, and grace was found in all the churches, and they prospered and, and had peace. Amen. So here's the thing. You don't have to take it as gospel. Point being is, why I'm using this, is that there was a story which seems to point to not only Israel being in Spain, but Israel being in Britain. And we've seen other documents that confirm this. So we had Israelites who were already there, right, living amongst these people. Now, we're going to talk about this because it's sort of weird as you go on, right? But understand, take it, eat the meat, spit out the bones, whatever. We're going to see that we already know that our people were in Europe already. That's a fact. We proved that through DNA. We proved that through history. But now we're proving that some of our people were in Britain. We've seen that in other documents. It was mentioned. But let's continue. 
So the children of Israel in Britain, Acts 29, 1. And Paul, full of the blessings of, Yish, of Christ and abounding in the spirit, departed out of Rome, determining to go into Spain, for he had a long time purpose to journey thitherward and was minded also to go from thence into Britain. So we see that according to Acts 29, Paul visited Britain. Why? Because there were Israelites there, all right? Acts 29, verse 2, for he had heard in Phoenicia that certain of the children of Israel about the time of the Syrian captivity had escaped by sea to the Isles of Far off. So he heard that Israelites were there, just as he heard that Israelites were in Spain, as spoken by the prophet and called by the Romans Britain. Nine white Jews in Britain. Were there nine white Jews in Britain? Do we have historical proof that black Jews were in Britain? We know for a fact that black Jews were in Spain and Portugal. We see that Paul in his manuscripts wanted to visit Britain first before he goes to Spain. Just as they have whitened out paintings and our times in Spain and Portugal, I believe they did the same with Britain. They have stolen the European monarchy from the Israelites. They have ignored the right to the rule of the scriptures. They have ignored the right to the rules of the scriptures. What is the rules of the scriptures? What does the divine right to rule mean? The right to rule derived directly from God, not from the consent of the people. The Glorious Revolution. In 1745, Jacobite rising really began in 1688 when King James II, also called King James VII in Scotland, lost his crown and was replaced by his own daughter and his Dutch nephew. This was called the Glorious Revolution. How did this happen? James was not very popular. He believed in something called the divine right. This means that he thought God made him king and he didn't have to listen to anyone. Why? Because he was an Israelite. Why? We're going to talk about that. That's why this divine right comes up. James followed a different religion to most of his people. He became a Roman Catholic. Now, although James was a Catholic or quote-unquote Christian, however you want, want to talk about it, he was not loyal to Catholicism. You're going to see. James followed a different religion to most of his people. He became a Roman Catholic while his people stayed Protestant. The people feared he'd make them all Roman Catholics too. This was a big deal at this time. People were scared of Roman Catholics taking over. Understand this, family. I'm going to prove to you. This is a lie. King James was not scared of people becoming Roman Catholics. As a matter of fact, King James did not like Roman Catholicism. As a fact, King James was trying to overthrow the Roman popes. I'm going to prove it to you. James' daughter Mary was still a Protestant. She had married her Dutch cousin William, who was also James' nephew. William was also a Protestant. Important people in government asked Mary and William to come to England with William's army and get rid of James. The people were happier with a Protestant royal family. Sounds good, right? Sounds all noble, right? But that's not what happened. In 1688, William and Mary became rulers of England and Scotland. King James did have his friends, though. They didn't like the idea of a foreign king and wanted James to come back because in Latin, James, in Latin, James' name is Jacobus. His friends became known as the Jacobites. Now, this is from the BBC. Now, there's a pro King James Roman Catholic twist here, but I'm going to show you it's a, it's a lie. The overthrow of a king. William summoned a, coven, a convention parliament to decide how to handle James' flight. It convened on January 22nd, 1689. While the parliament refused to depose him, they declared that James, having fled to France and dropped the great seal into the Thames, had effectively abdicated and, and that the throne had thereby become vacant. See, that you know how America does today. They come up, make up stuff, right? To fill this vacancy, James' daughter Mary was declared queen. She was to rule jointly with her husband, William, who would be king. On April 11, 1689, the Parliament of Scotland declared James to have forfeited the throne of Scotland as well. This was a conspiracy, fan. A lot of this stuff is, you know, crap. You're going to see what was happening. 
Israel's divine right to rule. So this is why, in my opinion, King James believed he had a divine right to rule because King James was a black Israelite. I'm going to prove it. Isaiah 14, 2. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And Israel will take possession of the nations and make them male and female service in the Lord's land. They will make captives of their captives and rule over their oppressors. Second Ezra 3, 55. 3, verse 55 to 59. I have said all these things before you, Lord, because you have said that you created the oldest age for our sake. You have said that the other nations born of Adam are nothing, that they are like spit, and you have compared their abundance to a drop from a pitcher. But look now, Lord, these nations that are valued as nothing rule over us and devour us. While we, your people, whom you have called your oldest offspring, or let's say his firstborn, your one and only child, those who are zealous for you, your dearest ones are handed over to them. If the world was created for our sake, why don't we possess our world as an inheritance? How long will this situation last? Last. Don't tell me nothing about God has changed, the promises of Israel is no more, and that he's not going to give the world to us. That's Eurocentric Christian belief system. So understand that Israel was always meant to rule. Israel, 1 Peter 2, right? Talks about Israel being kings and priests. Israel was always meant to rule. You don't like it, I don't care. So this is why he had the divine right to rule. Because the scripture said that Israelites will rule the world. So were the European rulers initially Hebrew Israelites? I believe that the rulers in Europe were black Israelites. Most of them were black Israelites. Israelites who ruled during and after the rule of the Moors. I also believe that after the Inquisition, Rome went after the remaining Israelites, the elite aristocracy that ruled Europe. The white European elite took the kingdoms from King James and gave it to the white Gentile elites. His daughter betrayed him, Mary, Queen of Scots. She betrayed him. She hooked up with William and behind the scenes hooked up with the Roman Catholics. Why? Because King James was against Catholicism. I'm going to prove it to you. They gave rulership to white Europeans during the Jacobite Rebellion. They also confiscated all of the land that the elite Israelites had and sent them to North America and the Caribbean as slaves. These elite Jacobites, what does Jacob mean? Israelites, descendants of Jacob. These elite Jacobites were sent where? To the same places the Israelites were sent as slaves to North America and the Caribbean. I'm going to show you. Not all who came to America, though, were enslaved. Some were classified as white with black complexion. Now, there's a whole classification mechanism of how they classify some of the elite. White at one time was meaning in terms of an elite status because their complexion was described as swarthy or black or ruddy or brown. You're going to see. So who were the Jacobites? Jacobism was a largely 17th and 18th century movement that supported the restoration of the senior line of the House of Stuart to the British throne. This definition does not tell us who they were. It tells us what they did. This was the final expulsion of the leftover Israelites that ruled Europe. The current, I'm sorry, the current rulership in Europe are usurpers. That current Rulership in England right now are usurpers. They took the throne from Israelites. Israelites ruled you ruled not only Spain and Portugal back in the day, they also ruled Britain. They also ruled Spain. They ruled, ruled Scotland. They ruled Britain. They ruled France. I'm going to show you. This is the secret they have hidden from you. Why? Because we were blessed. We were promised to rule the nations. In the beginning, when we were obedient, God allowed our enemies to fall at our feet. Yes, Germany as well was black. I'm going to prove it. What Benjamin Franklin said about Europe and the world. 
And since detachments of English from Britain sent to America will have their places at home, so soon supplied and increased so largely here, why should the Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania founded by the English become a colony of aliens or strangers who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Which leads me to add one remark, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. Listen to this. This is Ben Franklin, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. All Africa is black or tawny. Asia, chiefly tawny. America, exclusive of the newcomers, wholly so. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, the French, the Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans. Also, the sex also the sexes only accepted so the exception to those in europe who are not black or tawny are the saxons the anglo-saxons who with the english make the principal body of white people so the principal body during that time of white people were anglo-saxons now we got we got to ask ourselves a question fam as we go on for this next show i'm gonna do if the majority of europe was black Tony, people of color, Asia, people of color, Tony, where did all these white folks come from? How did Norway get populated with white? How did Scotland get populated with white? How did Ireland get populated with white? How did Italy get populated with white? How did French get populated with white? How did the Swedes get populated with white? If according to Ben Franklin, the only group of people who were white were the Saxons. So the Saxons only accepted who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth, on the face of the earth. I could wish their numbers were increased. And while we are, as I may call it, scouring our planet by clearing America of woods, and so making this side of our globe, their globe, reflect a brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants in Mars or Venus. I don't know what he mean by Mars or Venus. I think that's some new, some um, Freemasonry stuff. Why should we, in the sight of splendor beings, darken his people? Why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America, where we have so fair an opportunity? By excluding all blacks and tawnies of increasing the lovely white and red. But perhaps I am partial to the complexion of my country. For such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. Let me say something to the camps. White and red is the people who were in America, according to Ben Franklin. White and red was the people he wanted to stay in America. He didn't want no black folks. He didn't want no tawny folks he ain't want no people of color in america so come on with your foolishness telling me mexicans and native american indians israel y'all need to bring that proof like i'm bringing who were the people in europe before the moors after a time my son methuselah took a wife for his son lamech she became pregnant by him and brought forth a child, the flesh of which was as white as snow and red as a rose, the hair of whose head was white like wool and long and whose eyes were beautiful. When he opened them, he illuminated the house like the sun. The whole house abounded with light. And when he was taken from the hand of the midwife, opening also his mouth, he spoke to the Lord of righteousness. Then Lamech, his father, was afraid of him. And flying away, came to his own father's Methuselah and said, I have begotten a son, unlike to others, other children. He is not human, but resembling the offspring of the angels of heaven, is of a different nature from ours being altogether unlike us. So here, look, and don't, don't, don't call me a racist. I'm just sharing something with you. Understand here what we see is that the world was black. Benjamin Franklin confirms the world was black. 
Enoch says the world was black. But the children of the angels were white. The children of the angels were white. I'm not saying all white folks are the children of the angels. I'm not saying that. I don't personally believe all white folks are children of the angels. Some white folks are children of the angels, which is why some in the scriptures we see, the scripture says that there's tares amongst wheat. And the Most High said, leave them there to the end of the age so that the angels could do the separation because we can't tell the difference between the two. So in my opinion, these elite people, like the guy who's over the World Economic Forum, who's over the Great Reset, some of the elite rulers of these nations are descendants of the fallen angels. That's my opinion. Now, here's a tapestry. It's called Wild Men and Moors. And I want to give a shout out to my brother, Doug. Wild Men and Moors, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, right? White giants versus more. Now, look close, family. Look close. On the left here, you see these tall whites. What do they call the aliens? Tall whites. Here you see giant white folks. And here you see black folks. See this black man in the middle with the arrows? See this guy right here? He's tawny. See these black folks right here over there in the castles? Fighting a bunch of white giants. In Europe, wild men and Moors. So they admit with this tapestry that this black man is a Moor. It says wild men and Moors, German, probably Strasbourg, Alice, about 1440. So this tapestry was created in about approximately 1440s. And it shows a bunch of Moors or black folks who happen to be Israelites. You could tell he Israel. Look at his fringes. Look at the wrap around his head. I'm just saying, come on now. Fighting a bunch of people in Europe who are tall whites. I'm not trying to be racial, family. I'm just sharing history. It ain't my place. Look, I'm sharing history. Let's continue. So Jacobite, the name is derived from Jacobus, the Latin version of James. So King James is really King Jacob. Jacobus is a masculine first name, which is a variant of Jacob. Jake and James. So King James was really called King Jacob. He was an Israelite. Jacobite rebellion was an Israelite rebellion. As we've seen, Jacobite is from the name Jacob, our forefather, or more rightly called Israel. Therefore, the Jacobites were black Israelites in Europe. You don't believe me? I know some of y'all out there saying, he reaching. Let me prove it. Jacob bikes were black. They were black Israelites. Go back into history, all the way back to the Moors. We already discussed that. If you don't know about that, go watch the other videos. So this is a picture of King James. This is from a book by Lee Cummings, The Negro Question. There's also other references you can find this image. So this is a picture of King James. He looks like a black guy to me. You know, the first time I saw this and somebody told me King James was black, I was like, yeah, right. That's till I found out we were ruling in Europe. And when I found out we were in Europe ruling as Moors, as we found out that some of the Moors came to America and they were of the Israelite heritage. Come on. Now it all comes together. I mean, evidence after evidence after evidence. But understand this, family. This informa information is going to be very, very important for the next video I do. I'm telling you. The next video I do gonna blow your mind, but it's gonna, it's probably gonna have to be on Odyssey or Odyssey and BitChute because uh, they might shut me down on that one. But anyway, let's continue. So who was King James? That was the reason I paraded all of the English historians and professors before me. You be, you before I got into the bowels of this book. Now this is Leo Cummings. I had to get your mind ready to receive the truth. King James came from a long line of black Scottish Stuart kings. 343 years of rulership in Scotland. The Stuarts not only ruled in Scotland, they ruled France, Spain, England, Britain, Wales. We already discussed that and proved that, right? We saw what, what uh, Benjamin Franklin said. He confirms this. King James was able to rule all of these lands because all of these people were Iberian, black descent, 
they were the same people. If you look at the ball in his hand, it represents world rulership. And there was only one other group of world leaders who used this type of symbolism, and they were the Byzantine Roman emperors. Did not the Bible say that Israel will rule the world? If we obeyed his commands, we will rule the world. If we obeyed, he will put the nations under our feet. Until we turned away from the Most High, that promise was being fulfilled. We were kings. We like King James. He was an Israelite. He was a Jacobite. He his name was King Jacob. So the line of Scottish kings, you can see here. And I'm gonna skip down. I'm not gonna read all of these because you got Mary Queen of Scott who overthrew uh, King James. But you also have Charles the First, 1625 to 1649, descendants of King James, right? We have Charles II, 1649 and 1685, descendant of King James, right? So as you can see from the Scottish kings list, King James I of England was a descendant of the black Scottish kings who claimed the thrones of France. Oh, how can you say he was a descendant of black Scottish king? Oh, we're going to see. We're about to find out. I'm telling you, fam, there's something going on in this world and it ain't right. The Bible talks about a serpent seed, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. As I said, I'm not saying all people who don't have melanin are the seed of the serpent. I'm saying those top elites, more, more than likely, most of them are descendants of the seed of the serpent. King Charles I of England. Charles I was king of England, Scotland, and Ireland from March 27, 1625 until his execution in 1649. He was born into the house of Stuart as the second son of King James VI of Scotland. But after his father inherited the English throne in 1603 as King James I. So he was King James VI of Scotland, but he was called King James I of England. So he ruled over two nations. He moved to England, where he spent much of the rest of his life. He became heir apparent to the kingdoms of England and Scotland and Ireland in 1612 upon the death of his elder brother, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales. An unsuccessful and unpopular attempt to marry him to the Spanish Habsburgs, Princess Maria, Maria Anna culminated in an eight-month visit to Spain in 1623 that demonstrated the marriage negotiation futility. Two years later, he married the Bourbon princess, Henrietta Maria of France. Ain't no wonder that Paul went to Britain first and then he went to Spain. There was a connection between the, the Stuart lines. There was a connection between King James and the monarchies of England, France, Spain, Scotland, and Ireland. King Charles I's death. King Charles I had the unlucky distinction of having his head cut off by the English white subjects in his realm. King Charles I wasn't the only one to suffer this indignation. When the English overran the country, they hung and decapitated the men, raped the women, burned the citizens at stake, and dashed the children against the stone. This is a bit of history that is not taught nor reported in the annals of world history. Is that not what they did to us? Is that not what they did to us when they caught our ancestors? Rape, decapitate, burn. I'm just saying, I'm like, look like Israelites to me just by this, but let's continue. So King Charles II, King of Scots. Charles' appearance was anything but English. With his sensuous curling mouth, dark complexion, black hair, brown eyes, he much resembled his Italian maternal grandmother, Marie de Medicini's side of the family. Can I say black? During his escape after the Battle of Worcester, he was referred to as a tall black man. Oh, no. Wait, wait that can't be. No, Jacoba, you're making it up. Making it up, Jacoba. He was referred to as a tall Black man, remember he's a, a, a descendant of King James. He was referred to as a tall black man in 
Parliamentary Wanted posters. One of the nicknames he acquired was the Black Boy. His height was six feet, two inches, probably inherited from his Danish paternal grandmother, Anne of Denmark, also set him apart from his contemporaries in a time when the average Englishman was far smaller than today. He was called Black Boy. He was a tall black man. But I know what they're going to say. Black don't mean black. You know that's what they're going to say, right? Black don't mean black. They're going to say, these aren't the drawers you're looking for. You know that's what they're going to say, right? But they described him as a tall black man. <coughs> so as I mentioned, this is King James. This is the globe he had in his hand for ruling the world. He had the divine right to rule because he's an Israelite. He said, you can't kick me out because God ordained that Israelites are going to rule. I'm sitting on the throne of my fathers. You read the Bible as well as I did that Israel is going to be on the throne of the world. Yeshua is going to rule all the world. There ain't going to be no other nations. It's only going to be an Israelite nation. Oh, I know y'all don't believe that. At the end of the thousand year reign, check back. But let's continue. So James the sixth of Scotland became James the first of England. Charles the first was born in five of November 19, 1600, the second son of James VI of Scotland. From 1603, also James I of England. Like I told you, he ruled Scotland and England. His name was changed from the James VI of Scotland to James I of England. And Anne of Denmark, he became heir to the throne on the death of his brother, Prince Henry, in 1612. He succeeded as the second steward king of Great Britain in 1625. Is it no wonder? that Paul, assuming that Acts 29 is legit, it makes sense of why he went to Britain. There was an Israelite king ruling on the throne of Britain. There were Israelite kings, as a matter of fact, ruling all of Europe. Oh, I know you don't believe it. Yes, you got it right. They're going to say white-skinned Negroes, but he's black. He was a tall black man. Okay, Jacobites, black Jews. After Cromwell had executed King Charles I and ravaged the three kingdoms, the Jacobites tried to restore the black Stuart kings to power. They were known as Jacobites. One shall name himself Jacob, another shall name himself after Israel. Now, this is from Lee Cummings. Okay, that's his commentary. But they were black kings, and I'm going to prove they were black kings. Europe was ruled by black folks. They overthrew us. We got betrayed. They kicked us out, convert to Catholicism or die. That's why they had the Inquisition. And some of our own people had betrayed us. Britain versus France. There was another reason why the Jacobite rising of 1745 happened as well. Britain's greatest enemy at this time was France. In the 1740s, the two countries were at war. The French decided to help the Jacobites. Why was this? The French king liked the Stuarts. They were Roman Catholic, just like he was. The Stuarts were Scottish in Scotland, had been good friends with France for hundreds of years. The French king thought that the Stuarts were the true kings of England and Scotland, not Protestant Germans, not the white boys. There were other more secret reasons for the French supporting the Jacobites, though. If the Jacobites started a rebellion, the British would have to send troops to fight them. This would mean there would be fewer British soldiers fighting the French. If the Jacobites won France, won France would have a good friend as the new king of Britain. The Stuarts would probably fight with France rather than against it. When the Jacobites had invaded England, the French did plan to help by invading England as well. It was only the British Navy and nasty British weather that stopped it, or then stopped it. So here's something that's important. This is the Solemn League Covenant. This is where I show you proof that King James was not aligning himself with Roman Catholicism. He was not aligning himself with the popes, as some of those other documents were saying. Taken by the House of Commons, September 25th, 1643, 
Rushworth, 478 C. Great Civil War, a solemn league and covenant for reformation and defense of religion, the honor and happiness of the king and peace and safety of the three kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland, all ruled by blacks. We noblemen, barons, knights, gentlemen, citizens, burgesses, ministers of the gospel, and commons of all sorts in the kingdom, commons of all sorts in the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland, by the providence of God, living under one king, and being of one reformed religion, having before our eyes the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the honor and happiness of the king's majesty and his posterity, and the true public liberty, safety, and peace of the kingdoms wherein every one's private condition is included. And calling to mind the treacherous and bloody plots, conspiracies, attempts, and practices of the enemies of God against the true religion and professors thereof in all places, especially in these three kingdoms, ever since the reformation of religion and how much their rage, power, and presumption are of late. And at this time, increase in the exercise thereof of the deplorable estate of the church and kingdom of Ireland and distressed estate of the church and kingdom of our England and the dangerous estate of the church and kingdom of Scotland are present in public testimonies. We have now at last, after our means of supplication, rem remonstrance, protestations and sufferings for the preservation of ourselves and our religion from utter ruin and destruction according to the commendable practice of these kingdoms in former times and the example of God's people in other nations after after mature deliberation, resolved and determined to enter into a mutual land, solemn league and covenant, wherein we all subscribe and each one of us for himself with our hands lifted up the most high God do swear that we shall in like manner without respect of persons endeavor to extirpate a popery prelacy, that is church government by archbishops, chancellors, commissaries, deans and chapters, archdioceses, and all other ecclesiastical officers, depending on the hierarchy, superstition, heresy, schism, profaneness, and whatsoever shall be found to be contrary to sound doctrine and power of godliness. At least we partake in other men's sins and thereby be in the danger to receive of their plagues and that the Lord may be one and his name one in three kingdoms. So it was to extirpate popery extirpate definition to destroy completely wipe out so was king james really a catholic we saw in the solemn league covenant that king james and the jacobites wanted to extirpate popery so this was an alliance between the jacobites the solemn league covenant how could william mary be for the protestants and king james for the catholic church when he was against popery someone is lying it appears that the excuse that William and Mary were Protestants and King James was a Catholic was an excuse to take over the kingdom. The Solemn League Covenant beginning of Jacobite Rebellion. Although it distressed their allegiance, although it, the Solemn League Covenant, although the Solemn League Covenant stressed their allegiance to the king by signing the document, the coven covenanters, as they were known, undertook to protect the Scottish church against what they claim was the introduction of Roman Catholic modes of worship by then Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, who was trying to impose a new single liturgy and prayer book across England and Scotland. So the Jacobite Rebellion. On July 23rd, 1745, Charles of Stuart, the 24-year-old grandson of England's long-dead ousted King James II, landed in Mordart on the western coast of Scotland in the company of seven men. He intended to seize power in Britain, reverse the dynastic consequences of the revolution in 1688 on behalf of his father who lived in Italy, restore the deposed Stuart family to the British throne. Before sailing for Scotland, Charles Edward had been in correspondence with several British Jacobites, supporters of the Stuart dynasty, including prominent clan leaders and landlords in the Scottish Highlands. Some of these men greeted him near the coast. With their help, he raised a small army composed largely of Gaelic-speaking Highlanders. By mid-August, he and his men were marching south. In September, they took, they took the town of Edinburgh, leaving the government garrison beleaguered in Edinburgh's castle. 
The Glorious Revolution, the Overthrow of Israelites. The Glorious Revolution refers to the events of 1688 to 89 that led to the Catholic King James II of England being deposed and replaced on the throne by his Protestant daughter Mary II and her husband William, Prince of Orange. The Glorious Revolution permanently established Parliament as the ruling power of England and later the United Kingdom, representing a shift from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. So this is where we get this rulership of, by parliament, both in Britain and in the United States, which are run by who? People descended of Anglo-Saxons. So return of Israelite rule to England. The Jacobite struggle to restore the deposed Stuart dynasty to the British throne was a major threat to the success of a single centralized Britain. See how they wanted to rule and rule Britain? See, the parliament came together. This is universal control right that parliamentary oligarchy just like the new world order world government right centralized britain centralized world continuing yet for several centuries historians presented the jacobites as kilted primitives jacobite prisoners after their defeat many of those who partook in the rebellion were arrested and sent as slaves to north america and the caribbean enslaved jacobites in the years following 1715, the government pursued an array of initiatives designed to punish the participants in the rising and alter the social condition that allegedly facilitated the mobilization of Jacobites. After the Battle of Preston in 1715, hundreds of captured Jacob Jacobite soldiers were persuaded to accept conditional pardons from George I, requiring them to work in the colonies as bound laborers. As a result, at least 639 men, mostly Highlanders, were sent in bondage to North America and Caribbean. Before we continue, family, where did those Israelites get sent to? Uh, did they not get sent to North America as slaves? I'm talking about the Israelites. We got that in the historical documents. The Israelites were sent to North America and the Caribbean. We saw some of the quote unquote Sephardic Jews who live on some of the islands, right? Same thing with Jamaica and all these things, right? We, 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 you've seen those documents already. So, so this proves these people who were black, and I'm going to prove they were black, the Jacobites. They were sent as slaves to North America and the Caribbean. The prisoners were what? Sold. You know of any white folks being sold? I'm just asking. The, the prisoners were sold in what? Maryland. I have a question before I continue on. Uh, where did Matthias de Souza land when he got here? We know that Matthias de Souza was a Sephardic Jew. He was probably a Jacobite. Where did he land when he got here? Maryland. The prisoners were sold in Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, Jamaica, Barbados, St. Kitts, and Antigua. In general, the places that took them had labor shortages and depended primarily on slave labor. After the captured soldiers had been sent to America, other punitive measures were adopted by authorities in the Scottish Highlands. These people were Jacobites. They were trying to put King James back on the throne of Europe. They lost. They were sent to the colonies of Britain. They were sent there as prisoners of war. They were sold there as slaves. Not all Jacobites were black, but most of the Jacobites were black. How do you know, Jacoba? You're making it up. How do you know? Just because they were sold as slaves, they could have been white folks who were sold as slaves. What did these Jacobite slaves look like? You know I'm coming with receipts. You know I am. You know I'm coming with receipts. What did these Jacobite slaves look like? Jacobite gleanings from state manuscripts, short sketches of Jacobites to transportation in 1745 by Mac Keith Forbes. Jacobites were black Israelite slaves. An exact list and description of 150 rebel prisoners shipped at Liverpool on board the veteran John Rickey Master for the Leeward Islands, which were taken near Antigua the June, June 28, 
last by the Diamond Privateer, Paul Marcel, commander, and carried into Martinko, June 30th, 1747. So we know that these people were sold as slaves. Robert Adams, laborer. Brown, smooth face. William Bell, weaver. Berwick, black, curled hair, strong made. Dugall Campbell, servant. Brown, complex, well made, ruddy. Addis Catanock, Miller. Black, ruddy, ditto, ditto, healthy. Dugall Campbell, servant, brown. Alex, John and Alex, ditto, ditto, ditto. That means they're brown, brown, brown. Look at here, swarthy, ditto, brown, swarthy. I'm just saying, come on now. Black Jacobites trying to save a black king. Alex Davison, herdsman, ruddy, slim, made. Andrew Edwards, black, well made. I'm going to go on. Y'all can read the names. Brown, 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 black, brown, black. Now we got a thin, pale guy. We got one who was white. Black, brown, black, black, brown, brown. Look at the names on the left, fam. Andrew Langer, dark complexion, well made, healthy. James Lawson, well made, slender, ditto. John Troop, dark, sickly. George Samuel, brown, pale, slender. Probably sickly there, because how are you going to be brown and, and pale? Ditto, complex, well-made, dark, sickly, fair. We got a fair person. That's another range of color. We're going to look at that too. Brown, swarthy, sandy, dark hair, pale, thick, dark. Most of them black. Jacobites. Why? Because their king was black. The black nobility. Much of Europe was ruled by black Israelite kings. Descendant of those from the Moorish invasion, as well as those Israelites who went to Europe during the time of Nebuchadnezzar or the Assyrian captivity. The Negro as a Moor, one of my favorite books, Nature Knows No Color Line. Seven years after the capture of Gibraltar, the Moors invaded France. What? The Moors invaded France? Nobody taught me that. And conquered or overran most of its southern portion. They probably went as far east as Geneva, what, Switzerland, was then a part of France. In 732, they reached Tours, two days' march from Paris, but were beaten back by the Christians, white folks, under Charles Martel. They remained in southern France, however, until 1140, principally in the Camarque on the Western Riviera, which is still known as La Petite Afrique, Little Africa. In 838, they took Marseilles, and in 842, Arles, aided by fellow Muslims from the east, they captured Sicily, Italy. Remember, Italy was black. In 837, and took a million pieces of gold. In 846, they invaded Italy, seized Rome, plundered the Vatican, and St. Peter's Cathedral, and carried off immense wealth in gold, jewelry, tapestry, paintings. Later, with the Jews as intermediary, they sold black they sold back much of this loot to the Pope. Look, why sell that back to the Pope? Why they ain't take them out? We wouldn't have had none of this trouble later on if they took out them people. They made a huge mistake. I guess they didn't know how dangerous they were. In 982, they defeated the flower of Christendom under Otto II of Germany. Unmixed Negro troops, most of them from Ethiopia and the Sudan, furnished a large part of the Moorish or Saracen troops. Thereafter, they dominated most of Italy for years and parts of it until the 13th century when they were swamped by further white invasions from the north. Gradually, they were absorbed into the Italian population even as the Africans brought in by the ancient Romes had been. Anybody ever told you that the rulership of Rome, I mean, rulership of Europe was black? Did anybody tell you that the Moors ruled Europe? Did anybody tell you that they invaded and took over the Vatican and took their gold and their wealth and their silver and they, all of that? Did anybody ever tell you that they invaded France and Italy? Did anybody tell you? Nobody told me that. All I knew that everybody was white. In Africa, the Moors continued to be a leading power and to no little extent in India also. They dominated the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic and plundered the coast of Western Europe and the British Isles. They even conquered and ruled parts of Scotland. 
David McRitchie, eminent British archaeologist, says, so late as the 10th century, three of these provinces were wholly black, and the supreme ruler of them became, for a time, the paramount king of Transmarine, Scotland. We see one of the black people, the Moors of the Romans. So we saw that all of this lines back up to what Benjamin Franklin says. It lines up with what we see in history about the Israelites being in Europe, ruling Europe as Moors. It lines up with these black kings, and I'm going to continue to prove that these kings were black, were descendants of the Moorish rulership or hierarchy or elite. All of this because we took their gold. You know why they hate us so much? Because we ruled them. You know why they hate us so much? We took the Vatican gold. You know why they hate us so much? And they wanted to make sure we they don't they don't never see us again because we didn't make them look like fools. That's why. So this is uh, more black rulers of Europe. Memoirs of the Secret Services of John McKay. John Howes, Duke of Newcastle. John, Duke of Newcastle, is of the name of Howes, was Earl of Clare before the Revolution and married a daughter of the Laird Duke of Newcastle, who died without heirs male. King William created this gentleman a duke and gave him the garter. He had the best estate in England and employs most of his time in improving it. Is very covetous, yet makes a great figure at his seat in the Yorkshire. Is firm for the constitution of his country and had only and had one only daughter who will be the richest heiress in Europe. He is a black, ruddy complexioned man near 60 years old. What? He is a black, ruddy complexion man. Black, ruddy complexion man. I keep telling you, Europe was ruled by us. Europe was ruled by Israelites. Whether or not you want to call us Africans. Let's see all of these people over here who say America's our home pull out all this history. Let's see them make sure and pull out the history that shows all these things occurred in, uh, in the Americas. I want to see it. I want to see if they could bring all their receipts together. Charles Lennox, Duke of Richmond, is son to King Charles II by the Duchess of Portsmouth. He was carried by his mother into France in the reign of King James. What? In the reign of King James. And left France in the reign of King William when he declared himself for the religion and constitution of his country. He is a gentleman, good, natured, to a fault, very well bred, and had many valuable things in him. Is an enemy to Bonsnails, Bonsnails, I can't pronounce that, very credulous, well shaped, black complexion, much like King Charles. What? Black complexion, much like King Charles. Who was King Charles's father? King James. Not 30 years old. French kings. Why did Charles Leno's mother take him to France? I believe it is because the aristocracy there were black Israelites. King Henry IV of France. Henry was of a middle stature, deposed and active, hardened to labor and travel. His, bo his bo bo body was well formed, his temperament able and strong, and his health perfect. Only about the age of 50 years, he had some light assaults of the gout, but which soon passed away and left behind them a weakness. He had his forehead high, his eyes lively and assured, his nose aquiline, his complexion ruddy, his countenance sweet and noble, and he withal his presence, warlike and mar martial. His hair brown, very thin, he wore his beard large and his hair very short. He began to grow gray at the age of 35, upon which he was accustomed to, to say to those who wondered at it, it is the wind of my ad adversities had blown me this. He was, what was his complexion? Ruddy. Oh, well, ruddy don't mean he was black. He would probably, you know, you know how white folks get red. He was probably red like the rose. King Louis XIV of France. So what did Louis XIV inherit from his parents? Actually, he most closely resembled his bourbon grandfather, King Henry IV. 
displaying his sociability, sexual prowess, self-confidence, and political skill. And with due respect to Levi, Louis XIV swore the complexion. Wait, 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 wait. Didn't we just see Henry IV was uh, ruddy? And his descendant is what? Swore the complexion. And prominent nose were typically bourbon. He inherited his mother's good health and hearty appetite, born with two teeth. <laughs> two teeth. He demolished eight. <laughs> Nature knows no color line. Negroes coat of arms. I bet they ain't teach y'all this in school. Nature knows no color line. Another coat of arms. Black folks. Black folks rule Europe. Israelites rule Europe. Descendants of the Moors. Nature knows no color line. More color coat of arms. Of Israelite elite. More coat of arms of Israelite elites. Come on. Y'all gonna try to tear this down. I wanna see how y'all do it. Come on. I wanna see how y'all do it other than make up stuff like y'all usually do. I'm talking to y'all know who I'm talking to out there. I ain't gonna even mention their names. More coat of arms of Europe. Andrew's family crest. Fair so it's Fairbane, James Butters, Lawrence. McLaren Joseph, 1911, Fairburn's crest of the leading families, what? In Great Britain and Ireland. And their kindred in other lands, New York, heraldic pub, plate 135. More elites. What was he? A descendant of King James. He black. He ain't black. That ain't no dosy colophallic skull. Yes, it is. He don't have a black nose. Yes, he do. He ain't got a big lips. Yes, he do. Buller family crest, Fairbank, James, Royal Book of Crest of Great Britain and Ireland, Dominion of Canada, India, and Australia, derived from best authorities and family records. Black man, Israelite, black man. Rude Britain. I'm just asking, how much more evidence do we need? They didn't lie to the world. They didn't lie to you Gentiles. They didn't lie to everybody. We rule the world. Prove me wrong. I know y'all gonna come out with something, but you ain't gonna be able to, you know, validly debunk it. So, complexion defined. The specific meaning color or hue of the skin of the face developed mid 15th century. I'd like everybody to know that my theory, and I reiterate, it is not my theory alone, because I'm only one of many who have come to realize through research that the original Europeans had black, very dark brown, very swarthy, brown, light brown, seguine, tawny, olive, swarthy complexions. Not only were the original Europeans swarthy, a vast number of European nobility were swarthy, and many of them continue to have swarthy complexions until the early 1800s. Okay, so right now we're going to discuss two terms. Okay, the first one is swarthy, and the second one is complexion. Okay, many of you probably think you know what these terms mean, but let's go over them anyway, just to make sure we're clear because they're very important to the research. Okay, so the first term is swarthy, which means of a dark color, complexion, or cast. Okay, that explanation is straight out of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, 1828. Okay, so another explanation of this word swarthy is of skin color, complexion, etc., dark. And that is out of the dictionary.com. Then last, we have of a person or their skin, dark, a swarthy face, complexion. And that comes from the CambridgeDictionary.com. So if you go ahead and look up the term swarthy or the definition for swarthy in most dictionaries, either present or past, you will find basically the same explanations. Let's move on to the second definition, complexion. Complexion means the hue or appearance of the skin and especially the face. A dark complexion, and that comes from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, 1828 as well. 
there are several other definitions of complexion, one of them being the general aspect or character of something. And that definition comes from the lexico.com powered by Oxford. Nevertheless, just to be clear, when I speak of complexion in my research, I am specifically speaking about the appearance of someone's skin, especially their face. Okay, now that I've talked to you about the term swarthy and complexion, I'd like to go to this next area and talk about melanin. Okay, and as you can see on this this uh, picture here, uh, these are many of the various human skin tones or hues of melanin, excluding the extremes on both ends. My intention is not to exclude the extremes on both ends of the spectrum, but they are extremes nonetheless. Because we are so used to going from left to right, because we read from left to right in English, I'm going to start on the left side. And as you can see on my chart, we have pale, fresh, fair, sandy, tawny, light brown, ruddy, seguine, brown, and dark, or dark brown. And then you can also see swarthy there at the top, and you can see what's in between swarthy and what uh, most readers that I believe, or in my interpretation, regard as swarthy, okay, as we go on in this research. Let's go on to define the word melanin. You know, what is melanin? And it is defined as any of the various black, dark brown, reddish brown, or yellow, yellow pigments of animal or plant structures, such as skin or hair. And that is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And from the Cambridge Dictionary, we have the definition of melanin as a dark brown pigment substance that gives color found in eyes, skin, hair, feathers, etc. It helps to protect the skin against harmful light from the sun. So we defined swarthy, we defined ruddy, tawny. Now I want to make sure I say fair use straight up uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Y'all could go check him out. So we, we defined these colors now now you know people make up stuff they want you know they're gonna always throw those those gaslighting quips right uh but they can't defeat this information now why is this important this is important because a lot of times people don't see the fulfillment of prophecies because the whole world has been deceived and when i work on the next teaching you're going to see that the whole world has been deceived and that this whole thing is crazy, right? You, you're going to see some stuff that don't look right, some stuff that don't make sense. So Esau stole our heritage and hates us till this day. So I'm going to make the case that maybe some of these black folks are Esau. Maybe some of the ones who betrayed us are Esau. Why? The raw houses of modern Europe stole our inheritance and tried to replace us. Which is why we see in Genesis 36 the dukedoms of Esau. These were the dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho. We know about Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Gotham, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came to Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada, and these are the sons of Reuel, Esau's son, Duke Nahat, Duke Zerah, Duke Shama, Duke Miza. These are the dukes that came of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basamat, Esau's wife. Now, not to say that all Edomites are all white Europeans. Some Edomites are, of, are Japhet mixed with Esau's lineage. So understand, everywhere Israel went, Esau was hanging around. Don't think we were ruling over here in Europe and Esau wasn't there as well. Esau was our cousins. And as we see in the scriptures, Esau is the end of the world. Jacob is the beginning of that which follows. So according to the scriptures, Esau is the one in control at the end. See, this is just my theory. When William and Mary took control of the kingdom of England and Scotland from King James, right, that, that whole line of Anglo-Saxons, it was probably some of those Edomites. Right. They've always been hanging around Rome. Look, look at Herod. Herod was ruling over Jerusalem. 
So some of these leaders and elites were probably Esau. And not all Esau is white and not all Esau is black. So what I think is happening here is that Esau has made an alliance with the fallen because we know the Bible says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers and wickedness in heavenly places. And so I'm going to show you in the next video, I do some crazy stuff. Some crazy stuff. That's why I'm saying it may not be on uh, YouTube. So if, if you ain't subscribed to DC, Tail on DC or Tail on Bitch, you, 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 you might miss out. I'll see if I can put it on YouTube, but I may not. You're going to be missing some serious, interesting stuff. Because understand that the Bible is true. And everything, everything you got from them, you better re-examine. Everything you got from them, you best re-examine. They have lied about everything. They say you weren't the people and some other people were. They say Yeshua was white and he wasn't black. They say the Middle East is our home and I know it's not. I don't care what you say. You best re-examine what you've been taught. They lied about everything. If they told you that the water is, is blue, you best double check. If they told you that an apple is red, you best double check. If they told you they're going to let you go, you best better think about that again because they're going to enslave you. I'm just saying, these people, you best be cautious. I'm not saying all of them. I'm saying the elite. But some of the, I'm going to tell you, some of the lower level people know this stuff too, I'm telling you. If it wasn't for God, we would still be asleep, still enslaved, working for them. But I'm going to tell you this, family. We are a danger since we're waking up. See stuff like this. Now you know what happened in Europe. So conclusion. The conclusion of the matter is that after the Israelites got kicked out of Spain and Portugal, some of the ruling kings of Europe who were black complexion and probably descendants of Israelites had their kingdoms overturned by the white Europeans. Just as they whited out true history of the Israelites, they whited out the history of the Israelites in Europe who ruled. The divine right to rule comes from God himself. Israel is supposed to rule, not the other nations. Why? Because they are their spittle. That's Bible. That's that's second Ezra. Some of y'all don't want to adhere to that I, I understand because it ain't positive for the gentiles i understand you ain't got to accept it the divine right to rule comes from god himself who stated that only israelites will rule over the nations many gentiles seem to have a problem with this concept it literally pushes them over the edge our ancestors ruled most of the known world back then which is why they hate us so much they took vatican gold do you understand why the Vatican haters, they took Vatican gold? Our ancestors ruled most of the known world back then, which is why they hate us so much right now. They know that our rulership will return. That's why the world is in a chaos right now. God is not a man that he should lie. He said it, it will happen. Our ancestors lost their identity, culture, lands, kingships. But we are back now, and the enemy will fight us to maintain his rule. Some of the dukedoms could have been Edomites, which is why the Bible prophesied that Esau would be the end of the world. But Jacob is that which follows. Esau took all of our heritage and identity. What didn't they take? What didn't they take? They took your identity, your heritage, your children your lives, they took your rulerships, you don't even know who you come from, you don't know that you're royalty, I told you you're royalty, I did a teaching on you are royalty, they can't accept that, why, because there's no more Jew Greek, I know my ancestors did all this dirt to y'all, and I know we're still doing stuff to y'all today, but 
we still the, we still the same because they don't move Jew Creek. You ain't nothing but lowly little slaves. But I know the Bible says you're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. I know the Bible says that you're kings and priests, but you're just lowly slaves. You're descendants of slaves. But I told you you're royalty. God told you you're royalty. I've seen princes walking and servants riding like Why are the princes walking? Why are the servants riding on the horse? Because they stole everything from you. Look, if you like what we do, please support this ministry. Thank all the participants in this chat. Hope you all learned something. I want to thank all our Patreon supporters, our Cash App supporters. As you know, we're demonetized, so we ain't going to handle no smart chat. So if you like what we do, you want to see some more, you want to Allow us to continue doing and then support us. If you learn something that your pastors ain't never taught you or your, your teachers, then you might want to support us. Peace and blessings, Israel. Your captivity is ending. Love you with the love of the Messiah. And please support the Dry Bones Project.